Well, praise God. I'm, I'm so grateful to all of you who uh, took part and everybody that brought food and everybody that cleaned up. And it was, uh, it was absolutely awesome. It's amazing how fast a year can go. It was a year ago that we actually had our picnic uh, a year ago. <laughs> I just find it amazing how fast a year can go. And sometimes it can go in one day if it's your birthday. It's Debbie Amarini's birthday. She's hiding in the back with her husband, so it's good. Just want to recognize when people get old. It just seemed to go with my, the flow of my thoughts. I don't know. I never practice what I'm going to say up here, so I don't know. I'm, forgive me. I'm, I need to work harder. Welcome to Grace. We're going through the book of Luke, and we're still here in the chapter 4. We're going to finish chapter 4 today, uh, looking at a day in the life of Jesus. We're going to actually walk with Jesus, and there are these wonderful little snippets that Luke gives us that this is all within a 24-hour period. And we're going to take a walk with Jesus for a day. Wouldn't you like to do that? Yeah. Be with Jesus, hear him teach, watch what he does. Uh, just walk with him, except his life is not exactly a, a bowl of cherries. Uh, and we're going to see that as we go through. And if you think you're tired, and if you think you're worn out, and if you think you're irritable because you've got all these things pressing upon you, we're going to take a look at the life of Jesus and hopefully take some encouragement because Jesus is the one who gives us the ability to do all things that he has done. In fact, he says we will do greater things in his name than he has done. And so we have this wonderful ability, but let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your grace in our lives. Thank you for the, uh, your presence here today. I thank you for so many that have come to know you, that you have wooed us to yourself, that you have shown yourself to be faithful. And I pray that you help us today, that you might make an indelible mark on each one of our hearts as your spirit speaks to us as we read your word, we pray that we be conformed to the image of you. So Lord, we lift ourselves up. We pray that you help us not to be distracted with the cares and concerns of the day and that you might help us to see you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, the book of Luke, uh, the verse, the highlight verse for the day is Luke 4.36. Then they were all amazed and spoke among themselves, saying, What a word this is! For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. That's one of the fantastic things about Jesus and his authority that we're going to see in this 24-hour period as we look to Jesus and we watch what he does. In case you forgot where you were. We've been looking at the life of Jesus and beginning with the ministry of John the Baptizer, his birth, his life, and ultimately his beheading at one point. He only has a one-year ministry, a very short window. Hopefully, you guys will have a longer ministry than that. And we looked at the baptism of Jesus and how he was, how the, the spirit came upon him like a dove in, in the image of a dove, and it remained on him. And this was the initiation of his ministry as he went in and began to teach and preach. Jesus was tempted, and as we see, he was tempted in these very three definite ways, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, which are the same three ways in which we're tempted. And so we take examples from that and how he fought off the devil, primarily with the book of Deuteronomy, but with the word of God. So as we understand and learn the word of God, we are well defended against the attacks of the devil. I just forget how to use this thing is my problem, I think. And we looked at Jesus rejected in his own hometown of Nazareth and how he came and gave his life verse and said, you know, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news, the gospel to the poor. So as he came and gave this sort of a, a life um, mission statement, if you will, they all remarked at him at how intelligent he was and how much he knew. And he goes, how do they, how does he know these things? He's the carpenter's son. And they treated him with some disregard. And then he began to speak more truth to them, but truth that kind of irritated them like fingernails on a chalkboard. And they 
they got angry at him, forced him out of the, the synagogue where they were and onto the brow of a cliff where they were going to run him off and then presumably finish it off by stoning him. And Jesus was able to stop that somehow miraculously and just walk through the crowd like nothing had happened because it wasn't his time yet. And if it's not your time yet, it's not your time yet. You're invincible because God protects you. But if it's your time, you're done going home or not, but you're going into eternity. So a day with Jesus, we're going to take it from verse 31. And he went down to Capernaum, the city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbaths. And they were astonished at his teaching for his word was with authority. Now the synagogue was there, a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice saying, let us alone. I just imagine that's what it sounded like. <laughs> what have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him saying, be quiet and come out of him. When the demon had thrown him in their midst, it came out of him and it did not hurt him. And they were all amazed and spoke among themselves, saying, what a word this is. For with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits. And they came out. And the report about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. Now he arose from the synagogue and entered Simon's house. But Simon's wife's mother, that would be his mother-in-law, was sick with a high fever, and they made request of him concerning her. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she arose and served them. And when the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many crying out and saying, you are the Christ, the son of God. And he rebuking them did not allow them to speak for they knew that he was the Christ. Now, when it was day, he departed and he went into a deserted place and the crowd sought him and came to him and tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, because for this purpose, I have been sent and he was preaching in the synagogues of Galilee. So I feel like it's story time with Pastor Dave, and I just told you a story. <laughs> Verse 31, he went down to Capernaum. He went down to Capernaum because Nazareth, his own hometown, wouldn't have him. If you remember previously, they cast him out. He probably would have set up his ministry within his own hometown of Nazareth, but he didn't because they wanted nothing to do with him. It's interesting what a gentleman Jesus is, and he never goes where he's not wanted. It's the same today. If you want nothing to do with Jesus Christ, he'll leave you alone. And you will have to stand before him at one point in time, as every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord, and you'll have to deal with that on the basis of your own perfection, of which none of us has any. So he goes down to Capernaum, which is the hometown of Peter and Andrew and James and John. You remember the four fishermen uh, we've been introduced to. So this is their hometown, and Peter's house is now going to become the center of ministry. I don't know if you've ever done this, had your house become the center of ministry, where you have strangers coming in and out of your house and using your bathroom continually and going into your refrigerator at will staying up late at night while you're asleep. I don't know if you've ever done that, but I guess maybe I'm speaking from personal experience. Yes, they went to Capernaum and he went to set up shop in the city of Galilee and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. So much of what Jesus did is he went from town to town and he set up in the sanctuary or in the church, if you will, of the Jews, which would be 
um, their, their, their tabernacle, their local church in the area. And he would come, and part of the service was that somebody, if he was a visiting dignitary as Jesus was a rabbi, he would come up and read the scriptures and actually be able to, to teach on them. And so Jesus did this everywhere that he went. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word was with authority. It's interesting, because when he went to Nazareth, they were astonished at his teaching. They were amazed at all of his learning. And so it looks like, uh-oh, Capernaum's going to follow the same exact track as his previous place, which was with Nazareth. But Jesus, during the week, is teaching his disciples, presumably. Uh, you would hope he's not just sitting on a hammock somewhere, relaxing, you know, <laughs> catching a view of the Alps or whatever with all the other rabbis or the other pastors. But he's teaching his disciples, and it, you know, it just seems like no matter how much you teach them, they don't seem to know much at all, uh, much like me or us. So this is what Jesus does, but on the Sabbath, it's a special day. He's there with the people of God and worship. Verse 33, now in the synagogue, there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon, did, did you know that unclean demons go to church? Sometimes. And he cried out with a loud voice saying, let us alone. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> now in the synagogue, there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon. By the way, this is in the morning. That's what that's to remind me of. This is in the morning. Now, the synagogue, there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice saying, let us alone. What do we have to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Can, can you imagine what a crazy thing that is? You know, you come to church on a Sunday, right? And you think everything's going to be good. Nobody's going to talk with the pastor. And then suddenly somebody's got... Somebody's filled with a demon and they get up and they start prophesying. Hmm. You know, being an interruption, it's always, you know, when somebody's being very loud in church, it's always a, we have a clean one. Oh, that's good. Uh, but a demon nonetheless. Okay. We'll deal with that in just a moment. He had a spirit of an unclean demon, by the way, it's, uh, the, it's just to differentiate, this isn't Satan himself, this is one of the fallen angels who comes in and is plaguing these people. And people can be possessed, by the way, in case you watch TV too much, a place cannot be inhabited by a spirit. Spirits inhabit flesh and blood. They can also go into animals. Jesus cast them out of people into animals, but they don't like animals very much. They're not as interesting. So... Here, Jesus is now having this sort of uh, ministry inside the synagogue this is going on, which I find amazing. So, and he immediately takes charge of this as this guy's crying out. So a demon in church, could it happen? Yeah, well, we've had some strange things happen here, haven't we? And demon activity is real. You don't have to go looking for it. You don't have to put on your Sherlock Holmes hat and, you know, look under every chair and, and look for the devil everywhere. I mean, he'll find you. Wherever God is present, wherever his boots are on the ground and things are happening, demonic activity will follow. It's just the way that it is. I mean, much of the stuff that I struggle with and you struggle with is internal and mental uh, and emotional. Some of it's external, you know, like when you flick on the TV and you just happen to roll right at the one frame that is the most diabolical worst thing that you could see. And there it is in front of your face because you decided surfing would be a good idea. Uh, those kind of things happen. But a demon in church, that's rather interesting. So it could happen. And here Jesus as a rabbi is speaking and teaching and he's interrupted. So uh, great. Great to be Jesus, getting interrupted by demons. So, it's loud. You know why the demons are loud? Because they want to steal the glory from God. Because they want to be center of attention. Because they want to be the ones that people listen to. That's what you do when you're in an argument, right? When you get loud? It's because apparently they didn't hear you. Apparently, you didn't hear me when I told you how wrong you were. 
so I must be louder. By the way, it never works. It just makes people fight harder. So it's interesting how loud the demons are and how quiet the Christians are. It's so difficult for us to share the gospel with people that don't know Jesus. It's so hard, either sometimes because of the familiarity, uh, much as Jesus in Nazareth, or the fact that, well, I don't want people to reject me. And yet Jesus spoke out and he just gave it to him between the eyes. So what a great example for us. Notice what the demon says, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Curious. The demon used the, this pronoun, this us and we. This demon is speaking for all the demons. It's rather interesting. And they seem to be surprised at his presence. What do you have to do? What do we have to do with you? Jesus of Nazareth. You know, they're in the tabernacle minding their own business and Jesus shows up and they're like, what are you doing here? Which tells me something else. They know Jesus. These demons are orthodox in their theology. They know the truth. They know Jesus. They know he's the Christ. They know he's a savior. But they don't submit to him. They have orthodox faith. And yet they have none of the belief where they put their faith in him and they do what he says. You see, there's a difference between knowing about Jesus and knowing Jesus, having accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And he's my boss. He's the number one. He's the most important. There's no one that goes to the Father but by him. And I'm going through him, through his sacrifice on the cross. There's a very different thing than knowing about the historical Jesus or having a relationship with the living God. Amen? Amen. The demons don't get to choose. They've already chosen. And they don't get to repent. Aren't you glad you're not a demon yes. or a fallen angel? What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? They know his name. It's interesting when you use somebody's name in a conversation because you kind of take charge, don't you? Right, Mark? Yes. You see, there's a, there's a thing about using someone's name. When you use their name in a conversation, it's as though you're kind of taking authority or you're taking control. You want their attention. And this is what the demon does and calls him by name. It's rather interesting, don't you think? Yeah. Jesus of Nazareth. So the demons know him and they know him by his name. And they know that their judgment is coming because they're surprised. They say, what is it that you have to do with us? Like, it's not time yet. See, they know their judgment is sure and it's coming. And he was a little, you know, uh, unsettled about the fact that Jesus showed up. Are you, are you here to destroy us? And we've seen demons say this in the past. Are you here to destroy us before the time? If you remember when he cast them into the, the pigs. And so they know their judgment. They know it's coming. And they're not sure exactly what Jesus is up to. But they know that they're doomed. And they know him. But they don't know him in a relational way. They know him in a, in a cognizant way. They know who he is. They know his name. And this demon in, inside of the church gathering is now shouting this out for everyone to hear. That's kind of an interesting unveiling, don't you think? Is that the kind of unveiling you would like? I, if Charles Manson was on TV... And they say, so how are things going in prison, Charles? I say, that's great. I pull up Grace Bible Fellowship all the time, and uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful church. Uh, appreciate the pastor. <laughs> <laughs> Not exactly the advertising you want from Charles Manson. Unless, of course, the Lord changes his heart Amen. and makes him a new creation. But... Do you get the idea that this is not exactly the way Jesus wanted it to happen? In fact, every time Jesus does a miracle, you see it in Matthew especially, he says, listen, don't tell anybody. There are these lepers that come and they're, they're all healed. And he says, go show yourself to the priest. He's always sending people away, getting them healed and send them away. The demoniac and Gennesaret, he, the, he says, let me get in the boat with you. I want to be one of your disciples. He says, no, you have to go back 
to your family. Remember them? <laughs> you need to go back to them and show yourself and let them know the good things that God has done for you. So Jesus is always pushing people away from himself. He's never trying to gather people except for the disciples when he taps them and he says, you, follow me. And he knows exactly which ones will say yes. And he knows if they say no, why? And I, I just appreciate that about him. But they know Jesus and they have good orthodox theology and yet they have no submission. And it can be that way with us. Well, we know all about Jesus. We can, we can quote scriptures. We go to church, the whole deal. But I don't do what he says. You know, that's, you know, whoever does what Jesus says. I mean, and that can be the mentality. And that's the way a lot of the world looks at Christianity. Just a bunch of hypocrites. And like I've said before, there's room for more. You, you, you can always show up here and you'll be one of us. Demons are smart and yet they're not submitted. Demons are smart, but they're not submitted. I find it amazing that the demons have to respond when Jesus speaks. Jesus speaks, he says, get out. And they do. Amen. Jesus rebuked him saying, be quiet, come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him in their midst, it came out of him and did not hurt him. Can you imagine Somebody standing up with a, with, a, with a demon and rebuking them and telling them, shut up and get out. That's what Jesus said. It's right up here. Shut up. Be muzzled is actually the original language. Be muzzled. But just shut up. Shut it. Shut up and get out. Which is what you want to do with demons, by the way. It's an interesting thought casting out demons and there are some people that have a ministry of this and they go around like I said with the Sherlock Holmes hat looking for you know demons everywhere you know. there's only one group of people that did that in the book of Acts and they're called the sons of Sceva and it didn't go well for them they, they went in and they tried to rebuke a demon in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches you see, they knew the name of Jesus. They knew about Jesus, but they didn't know Jesus. And the demon says, Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. But who are you? <laughs> and stripped them naked and sent them running out into the streets. So if you want to take on that kind of ministry, make sure you know Jesus. Amen. And then the demons will know who you are. And they'll know that you carry the authority of the Most High God, which is a very different thing. So Jesus teaches us something else about casting out demons and spirits. In Matthew 12, 43 to 45, it says, when an impure spirit comes out of a person, notice he's talking about a person. He's going to mix metaphors in a moment. It goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. By the way, the house is the human body. I will return to the house that I left. And when it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean and put in order. And then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself. And they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person, of that person, is worse than the first. That is how it will be with this wicked generation. The, Jesus was just accused of casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub, who's the Lord of the flies. And so he says, well, how is it that your, your sons cast out demons? And when I cast out a demon, it's, it's through the power of Beelzebub. What about your sons? Who, who do they cast him out in? So what's the difference here? And Satan can't stand against Satan or his house will fall. And then he gives this interesting thing about casting out demons that they look for a place to inhabit. They come back to the person or to the building in which they occupied and they find it swept clean and everything in order. And then seven spirits worse than the first come. The picture is this. If you get your life together and you stop smoking pot and drinking alcohol and, you know, messing around and you get yourself all straightened up on the outside, it doesn't ensure that you're not going to get filled with a demon or that you won't become seven times worse unless Jesus fills you. 
The house has to be filled. It can't be unoccupied. You see, either you're going to serve the Lord or you're going to serve yourself. And the devil loves that. If you're not filled with the spirit of God, if you haven't come into a relational, conversational adoption where you've submitted your life to Jesus Christ, you open yourself up to demonic activity. But if the house is filled, it's not going to happen. A Christian cannot become possessed by a demon. Regardless of what you say about your mate. <laughs> if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit has filled you, and he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And so you're not going to be able to get possessed by a demon. Now, there are some churches that believe you can. And for those people who think that you have a demon, and yet you know the Lord Jesus Christ, and you've been filled with the Spirit, you should go to those churches. And maybe every week they could cast demons out of you. That'd be great. But it's not biblical. And it's not scriptural. So, shut up. Get out. It's a truthful statement from a bad witness. It's bad advertising. So Jesus tells the evil spirit, not only shut up, but get out. So it's a double command. And, you know, that's, that's all he said. It wasn't, it, it wasn't, you know, should have bought a Honda. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't do anything magical. There's, you know, I got to go get some fairy dust. There's no chemical reaction here. Drink this thing. There's no delay. There's none of the stuff, the hokey stuff that you see on TV. Here, here, pull my finger. You know, I, there's none of the weirdness that you see on Christian TV. I, I'm just saying, this Benny Hinn junk, this stupid, bad advertising for the true and living God. It's everywhere. But um, forgive me, I go off on a tangent. A truthful statement from a bad witness is bad advertising. That's why it's so important to be a good witness. Because people say, Dave... Didn't, didn't I just see you, you know, you were like shooting up yesterday. What, what, what is this? Or something of that nature. Being a bad witness gives a bad face on Jesus, which is the worst possible thing. It's a good thing you can repent of that. It's a good thing Jesus will grant you forgiveness, but also the power to repent so that it never happens again. So, evil spirits. It's not even October. Demons must submit to the command of Jesus. How is it that we don't and get away with it? You know, demons have to obey. When Jesus says it, it happens. They can't be disobedient. There's no battle. There's no fight. There's no conversation. There's no, hey, can't we work something out? No, they're done. Jesus said it, it's done. You know, we're the only living creatures that can disobey God. Human beings. Because God gives us freedom of choice. We love to boast about that. Why is it so hard for us to submit to God when everything else does? He tells the sun to rise, it does. He tells a person to get up, and they do. He can raise the dead. And yet, the hardest thing to tame is a human heart, isn't it? And that's the greatest wearisome thing, I think, in life. And it's the most disappointing thing in ministry. Pray that the Lord gives us strength to do that and submit to him. And then they were all amazed and they spoke among themselves saying, what a word this is. For with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. And the report about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. So Jesus is now developing his ministry in Capernaum and there's a reputation that's gotten started. And they say that he spoke with a power and an authority that none of the other rabbis did. And they, you know, he doesn't speak like those guys. He doesn't talk about, he doesn't refer to, uh, you know, he doesn't refer to these old rabbis. He doesn't refer to all of that. He speaks authoritatively. And an example of it is in Matthew chapter seven, or I'm sorry, chapter five. Jesus begins in verse 21. He says, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, you see, Jesus is claiming supreme authority. 
by saying that. He says, you've heard, you've heard the teachers of the law, you've heard the Pharisees, you've heard Moses, you've heard all of these folks say this thing, and yet you don't understand what it means. I'm telling you, you see, he's taking authority. He's taking authority over all of them. And this is how Jesus spoke. It's, it's almost like he wrote it. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone says to his brother or sister, Raka is answerable to the court. By the way, that means empty head. Did you know you can go to court for calling somebody an empty head? I, I can think of worse things. Is answerable to the court. And anyone says, you fool, will be in danger of fire of hell. That's what Jesus says. Your words are so important because what's going on behind that is what's happening in the mind and the heart. In verse 27, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So Jesus is taking authority over all of the scriptures and over all of the rulers, which is why you don't see me quote a lot of people. <laughs> I just go to the scripture. The scripture is pretty clear about what the scripture says. So you won't say, well, you know, John MacArthur says this and, you know, uh, you know, this, this person and that person and this, and, you know, and there are people that just rabble off all of these teachers and they rest their authority upon what these other men have said. You become a follower of a man at that point, or you're going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ and you follow the word of God like you good people, right? All right, good. Don't make me feel bad. So it has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. That's what they heard in the synagogue. But I tell you, Jesus says, anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality takes, makes her the victim of adultery and anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So Jesus goes behind the word and he goes to the heart of the matter. In verse 33, again, you have heard it said, to the people of long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill, your, fulfill to the Lord the vows that you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all. You know why? Because you got no power. I, I have a lot of people say, Pastor, I'll see you tomorrow at church. Well, you, you know, you should don't say that. I would not say that if I were you. Because I've had a lot of people say that and I just don't see them. Don't make an oath at all. Don't, because you don't have the power to perform it, right? Doesn't mean you shouldn't plan. Doesn't mean you shouldn't try to do things. And I have a schedule. My whole phone is full of schedule. But don't say with such assurance upon your own strength that you think something's going to happen. You can't do that. The only way you're going to do that is by the power of God. So don't swear at all. Don't swear, don't make an oath at all, either by, either by heaven, for it is God's throne. Don't do it by your own head. Don't do it by the altar or the goal on the altar or the sacrifice. Jesus goes on to explain all these things that people do. You know, like we say, I swear on my mother's grave. Like, what does that mean? <laughs> do you carry your mother's grave with you and you're going to put it on deposit in case you don't do it? Or what is that? No, I, I swear to you, I swear. On my own life. What does that mean? You have control of your own life? Anyway, sorry. For you've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And Jesus continues with that teaching. In verse 43, you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So Jesus is always speaking with this kind of authority. And that's what they recognized about his teaching. It wasn't, well, it really doesn't mean what it says here because <laughs> there are so many exceptions and we really aren't sure what Jesus said. And that's a bunch of junk. If you have a tape, a CD or a, a program where the teacher rolls off into that, shut it off, burn it, throw it away. Amen. Do everyone a favor. <coughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm a little traumatic today. <laughs> Maybe it's my back hurting. Here we go. So Jesus gets this reputation for having authority because this is how he teaches. Now, he arose from the synagogue and entered Simon's house. By the way, this is afternoon. 
You spent the morning with Jesus in church and had a demon pop up. Now we're in the afternoon. He arose from the synagogue and entered Simon's house. By the way, this is the guy you know as Peter. And Jesus renames him and calls him Peter Cephas, which means rock. But Simon's mother's wife's mother was sick with a high fever. And they made request of him concerning her. So imagine church is over. Thanks for coming. Bye-bye. You jump in the car and you go home and you're anticipating food. Now, I know none of you are hungry after church. <laughs> we hardly have anything left when we have fellowship. And that's a good thing. And it's a natural thing, especially if you haven't eaten when you're coming here. But here they are, Jesus and his disciples, and they're coming home from church and they crash Peter's house. You ever have somebody come unannounced to your house? Just knock on your door, a pop in. There are people who specialize in this popping. <laughs> so they're, they're going to show up. And by the way, this is Peter's mother-in-law. You know how you get one of those? You get married. Peter was married, by the way, the first pope. <laughs> who knew? And in Corinthians, it also says that he was married and his wife traveled with him from place to place. Can you imagine? It doesn't say anything as to whether they had children or not, but can you imagine what that's like? Traveling with Peter, being married to Peter? Can't be as bad as what my wife has, but it's gotta be pretty close. <laughs> he arose from the synagogue and entered Simon's house. By the way, this is Peter's house, which has been preserved and a synagogue which is right by Peter's house. So you can actually go to Capernaum and see this thing. Uh, the large uh, spaceship looking structure is actually built over by his house. And the, the uh, um, synagogue is actually the, the larger, more formal structure. So you see church was a short commute. As soon as, as, soon as synagogue was over, they're, they're gonna crash Peter's house and they go there. And, and who do you think is there? His mother-in-law because they had multi-generational homes. By the way, I'm, in, I'm a big fan of multi-generational homes because the younger learn from the older and, and the older get assistance from the younger. At least that's how it's supposed to work. So here's Peter's house and this is, you see where it is on the Sea of Galilee. It's uh, kind of a cool place for a fisherman to be. And so this is where it is. So they get there and she has a high fever. And so the disciples say, hey, Jesus, um, lunch isn't ready. It's like, okay, I can be patient. It's like, well, I got a little problem. Peter's mother-in-law is sick. She didn't get up. They had no time to vacuum before all you guys showed up. Um, just wondering, could you help her out? And so they seek Jesus on her behalf because she's got a fever. Now, Luke, there, Luke is a doctor, by the way. He'll notice all these little things. And he says she was in the grip of a fever. Now, if you're in the grip of a fever, there are two types of fever in the Greek. There's a light one, which is you feel ill and sick to your stomach and that kind of thing. And there's another thing where you're just knocked out. You're sweating, hallucinating, half unconscious. You're in bed, you're horizontal. And if you had COVID, you, you get an idea what that's like. This is where she was. She was very ill. She couldn't make it to synagogue. That's, that's a big deal. And she couldn't get up to, to make food for Jesus. And so Jesus and his boys just show up. How would you like to see Jesus and 12 disciples show up at your door after church? Hey, we're here. We're here for lunch. I think you'd be shocked if I just went home with any one of you. I said, so what are you doing? Oh, we're going to get lunch. Oh, all right, I'll, I'll get my stuff. That'd be enough of a shock. But, uh, but I, like um, the house is a wreck. I got to apologize before we even get there. I mean, I, I don't know. I feel that way. Maybe you don't feel that. Maybe your house is perfect. But my wife would be a little put off if I said, hey, um, we're, we're going to have 13 guys show up for lunch, by the way, right after church. So Jesus is heading over to his house and she's sick. So he stood over her and rebuked the fever and it left her. And immediately she arose and served them. This, this little two-line event that happens at 
Peter's house. Jesus comes home to a hot mess, okay? The mother-in-law is sick. There's no lunch. It's a disaster. I mean, he, he's been working hard and casting demons out and stuff. Do you think he could use a break? You want to put his feet up and relax a little? Maybe have a little something to eat, a little something to drink? No, there's no rest for Jesus. Just like there's no rest for us sometimes. And we think, well, I deserve a break today. At least I saw that in a commercial. <laughs> and he comes into the house, and instead of expecting to sit at the greatest place and have the meal all set out and, you know, have the meal all done and ready waiting for him when he gets out of synagogue, there's no meal. The, the, the house is a shambles probably because she's been ill, and she's flat on her back. And the disciples seek his favor for her. Isn't that what we should do? Seek the favor of Jesus for other people who aren't well. We should be praying for them. Yes. Rachel wasn't able to make it today because she's not feeling well. I was able to practice what I preached today. And there are others. We seek Jesus on their behalf, and he says he rebuked the fever and it left her. It's that same kind of authority. Matthew adds this from Isaiah 53. This is what it was meant when it was written. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He quotes this from Isaiah 53, how Jesus took upon himself the sickness. He took upon himself all of the, 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 the evil spirits he took upon himself and all the inconveniences that you and I would be bothered by and go, so no lunch. Peter, you cooking? You know. And yet Jesus took upon himself our griefs and he carried our sorrows, and I am sure he did it lovingly. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. That's a spiritual thing, isn't it? He was bruised for our iniquities. That's a spiritual thing, isn't it? The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. That's a spiritual thing, by the way. People pull that out of context and think, well, because Jesus was beaten, therefore I should have perfect health forever from head to toe. And yet, that's talking about our spiritual wellness, isn't it? But the one that does talk about our physical is up here in verse 4. For he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Those griefs actually mean sicknesses. He's taken them away. So, if you're going to quote that passage for physical perfection, you can't quote four. You got to go back. Yeah, I mean, you can't quote five. You got to go to four. So that was a joke. <laughs> the immediate result of Jesus healing her was service to him and the disciples. She immediately popped up. Hey, you guys are here. Oh, sorry. I don't have anything ready. I didn't vacuum. If you watch the Chosen series, it's a great series, by the way. They do a wonderful job of showing the whole spirit of that. She just pops up and she's instantly serving Jesus, instantly serving the disciples. And by the way, that's the response of someone when Jesus does a work in their life. You instantly want to serve the Lord. You instantly want to serve other people. You just, you're just overwhelmed. You have this love in your heart, and you just want to do that. If you don't know what that is, well, maybe you've been saved too long. Which is why having people who are younger Christians around you is a really great thing. Jenna. Jenna is an infectious person <laughs> with, with her spirit. And she is so grateful and so thankful to be in this church that God has called her here. Spend some time with Jenna. <laughs> she is like this mother-in-law that's been healed and she's like, I get it. Awesome. What can I do? Where can I go? Hey, how do I become a member? Let me get this done. Do I, do, what, what, what do I have to do? Hey, can I sing and worship team? Really? <laughs> What about evangelism team? Can I be a, okay, I can do that too? Oh, that's awesome. My, my wife says, who, do you, who would you pair up with Jenna? I was like, no, don't you do it. You yenta. I said, Jenna is good just as she is. You leave Jenna alone. Don't introduce her to a man. That's a wrong thing. But 
when Jesus does a work in your life and you go from being sick and helpless in your life and suddenly you're 100% well, you want to put it to work as a thank offering to God. You want to make something of your life. And that's what we should be doing. If Jesus has done a work in your heart, there should be joy. And there should be this willingness to serve one another. There should be a patience with people that, like your pastor, that goes on too long. You just be patient. <laughs> so should it be with us. We should have that same level of activity and excitement about serving Jesus and his people. When the sun was setting, by the way, this is evening. <laughs> when the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. That sounds like a simple statement. Why all of a sudden when the sun goes down? Because it's the Sabbath. It's Shabbat and you don't do any work. You only walk a certain amount of steps. I mean, the, 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 the Jews made sure that people were locked down with all the rules and all of the little shortcuts that you could get around. And so suddenly the sun goes down and according to Jewish tradition, you're supposed to see three stars. If you see three stars, it's considered evening. You're done. You're off the hook. Shabbat is over. You can go anywhere you want, do anything you like. And so any of them who had sick, any of them, we're talking about all of Capernaum. If anyone had anything going on physically, how many of you presently just in this small group have something physically going on that you would like Jesus to deal with? Wow, most of you. Amazing. So imagine a town, probably not New York City town, but certainly more than us. Everyone, Luke makes sure, I'm sure he's saying, are you telling me everyone? Everyone. Anyone? Anyone. All of them? All of them. Now, Luke has taken this down and he's a good note taker. When the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases, not any one disease, brought them to him. Jesus, you and your disciples can stay for lunch, but who are these people? And there's crowds of people walking up the road and you go, uh-oh. <laughs> Shabbat is over. Just when you thought you could take it easy, put your feet up, Jesus. Jesus. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. Every one of them. <laughs> Nobody left behind. Jesus has a really good plan. No one is to be left behind. Nobody. And he laid his hands. Do you know how personal that is? To touch somebody? To, to, to share that physical touch? There is, there is something special there. That's why we're a hugging church. Amen. Okay? I mean, you know, during quarantine, it was like... <laughs> you know, was, and then uh, you do the air hug, you know. <laughs> because that touch assures the other person that there's nothing between us. That there's, there's love and there's a commitment to one another and we're family. So Jesus touches all of them. All of them. So, so what'd you do today, Jesus? Oh, well, I went to synagogue and I had to cast out a demon after I taught everybody. Okay, and then, then you were able to take it easy, right? Yeah, we went to Peter's house. His mother-in-law was sick. Had to cast out a fever. Okay. So then you took it easy for the rest of the day. Well, no, just till the sun went down and the whole town came out <laughs> with anyone that had any sickness at all. Do you ever get to the place... Like maybe after work or maybe you've had a hard day and you go, wow, I just want to take a break. How do you think Jesus felt? How do you think his disciples felt? Ministry is 24-7, isn't it? And we're all in ministry. There are no interruptions, just appointments I wasn't aware of. There are no interruptions in your life. I mean, I've... I've seen people <laughs> having a conversation with someone and someone step up and interrupt them. They go, hey, can't you see I'm talking? Whoa. 
Oh, dude, sorry. I thought you were like Jesus. Or somebody say, hey, 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 can I, can I bother you? No, 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 I'm too busy. I'm too busy. I got things going on. That's why I, I, I hate it when you guys say, Pastor Dave, listen, I hate to bother you. I, I know you're so busy. <laughs> don't tell me how busy I am. Don't tell me how busy I am. I know how busy I am. You have no idea how busy I am. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. It just doesn't <laughs> matter. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I won't get everyone to say it. But there are no interruptions. Do you understand that? With life, because God is sovereign, there are no interruptions. And Jesus understood this. And there's not, you know, getting set something in your head like, oh, finally, as soon as service is over, oh no, I got to go to the baptism. You know, there's none of that. Because you don't set an expectation of selfishness because you'll always be disappointed. You just say, Lord, what would you have me do? And trust that the Lord's going to take you where you're going to go and he's going to give you the strength that you need to do what you need to do. That's what it is to be a Christian. And it's awesome because there's all kinds of power in that. Every one of them, Jesus healed every one of them that is a ministry mentality. A ministry mentality is, Lord, help, use me as a resource for everyone else. Amen. Use me as your hands and your feet, your voice, your heart for everyone, anyone. You know, the, the, the guy they wanted to be justified came to Jesus and said, well, who's my neighbor? Because they said, Jesus, what do you think the greatest commandment is? He said, well, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And upon these two hang all the laws and prophets. And then the guy wanting to be justified said, well, who's my neighbor? <laughs> Bottom line, everyone's your neighbor. Amen. You share airspace, internet space, whatever it is, that's your neighbor. Every single one, that is a ministry mentality. And demons also came out of many. Oh, that's great. It's not just healing sick people. Crying out and saying, you are the Christ, the Son of God. And he, rebuking them, did not allow them to speak, for they knew that he was the Christ. There again, bad advertising. You don't want bad advertising. Now, when it was day... It's 24 hours later from synagogue, right? I told you it was a day in the life of Jesus. And when it was day, which means he stayed up all night with all these people, and he didn't let one of them go away without being ministered to. Amen. You know, it's 930. Don't you think you should go home? Didn't we talk enough about your problems? <laughs> Not Jesus-style ministry. Now, when it was day... He departed and went into a deserted place. Even after a day like that and a night like that, Jesus woke up early. And the crowd sought him and came to him and tried to keep him from leaving them. Well, that's completely different than Nazareth. But he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also. Because of this purpose, I have been sent. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Galilee. Such a different thing from Nazareth. If you remember, he spoke at Nazareth and nobody wanted to hear what he had to say. They were going to throw him over a cliff and kill him. These people wake up early in the morning and they say, hey, where's Jesus? I imagine they're the well ones who were healed the night before. And they're like, where's Jesus? We just want to be with him. We want to spend time with him. And he's not around. What, what do you mean he's not around? We, we need to stick by Jesus forever in case something happens, you know, if we get sick. <laughs> Better than a hospital. 
and they find Jesus. And whenever you see the Bible use multitudes or mixed multitudes or crowds, your, your antenna should go up because these are not converted people. They may have been healed people, but they're not converted people. And so you've got all sorts of different people with all different kinds of motives. And they're coming to Jesus because they don't want to let him go. And they don't want him to go away. And Jesus tells them, I'm going to have to. Because God himself has called me away. I've got work to do. I've got places to go. I've got people to see. I can't stick around. It would be convenient for Jesus to put his feet up and just kind of kick back and say, yeah, you know, the kingdom of God has come to Capernaum. That's cool. But he knows that his ministry is much bigger than that. And the reason he has focus is because the very first thing in the morning, even though he was up late, he went and spent time with his heavenly father. And he had the right focus and the right heart, which is what we need to do. I don't know about you, but the history of me coming to church in the past has been waking up as late as possible, doing the least amount possible to get out the door, gather my wife, gather my children, and race off to church exceeding all speed limits. <laughs> so I don't appear to be out of place because I'm late and rush into service and then hope I'm going to rush before the throne of God to worship him. And I'm in no shape. As a pastor, I get to get up early. I get to spend some time with the Lord. And it makes all the difference for me. Because I get to remember who he is and who I am. And what I'm supposed to do. If not, Jesus could have been open to, yeah, sure, I'll hang around. Whatever. Seems like a nice place. Maybe we'll go fishing, go on a boat ride. You know, I could, there's a lot of nice things you could do in, in the Galilee region. But he says, I can't, guys. I've got things to do. So Jesus takes time. I used to know how to work this thing. I did. And so they found him. <laughs> you know, he probably, if it were me, I would have gone out by the the Sea of Galilee there and, and just kind of meditated to get, you know, and suddenly the crowds find him. So you can't go, Jesus. You got to stick around. I mean, what if something happens? And I appreciate their heart, but I also appreciate the fact that Jesus knew his ministry was bigger than just one place. You know, the Lord might be calling you to step out of the boat, so to speak, and do something more than what you've been doing to take another step. I would encourage you, if the Lord has called you to do such a thing, that you do it. Because on the other side is tremendous blessing. And the Lord goes with you, and he gives you the strength to live a day like a day in the life of Jesus, where going into the synagogue should have been uh, an easy thing, and it wasn't. And going to lunch at Peter's house should have been an easy thing, but it wasn't. And being able to recline and, and sit back with his disciples and take it easy should have been an easy night, but it wasn't. And then to wake up first thing in the morning and seek the face of God for strength. That's what we need. And if Jesus did it, we need it so much more. I just want to encourage you guys with the word today. Has the Lord spoken to you? Has he spoken to your heart today? As the worship team comes up, I'd like to pray with you and commit these things to the Lord. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we look at the life of your son Jesus and everything that he did. We look at his selfless nature, how he wasn't irritated when his own conveniences were put aside for the needs of others. Teach us, Lord, to be like Peter's mother-in-law. That because of what you have done in and for us, that you would work through us to be a blessing to you and to the people around us. Lord Jesus, encourage us and help us to live like you in every way. 
where there are no interruptions, just appointments we weren't aware of. Lord Jesus, help us to walk in your spirit so we don't fulfill the lusts of our flesh. Thank you for this great day and this wonderful opportunity. Lord, I pray a special blessing on those being baptized today that you might renew their hearts and minds, that you might encourage each one of us to live more fully for you. Be with us, Lord, as we do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.